Hello and welcome to another Talking Shop with Covering Climate Now. I'm Mark Hertzgard, the Executive Director of Covering Climate Now and the Environment Correspondent for The Nation magazine. On today's Talking Shop, our subject is food, water, and the climate connection. Thank you all for being here. Food and water is the theme, actually, of the next joint week of covers that Covering Climate Now is organizing our partners to undertake. That begins next Monday, June 27, and will continue through the July 4 holiday uh, here in the United States. And I have to say, when we at Covering Climate Now chose the theme of food and water back in January, we had no idea how prescient, how distressingly prescient it would be. Although we don't see it on too many uh, TV screens yet, severe hunger is spiking around the world. The number of people who are suffering from so-called food insecurity, which is a bland bureaucratic term for being desperately hungry, that number has doubled in the past two years to an estimated 276 million people. That's a big abstract number, but that's 276 human beings who don't have enough to eat. The war in Ukraine is one reason why that has stopped up the uh, global supply attack on one of the world's leading bread baskets. COVID, of course, is a second reason many people have lost their jobs and income, and more poverty means more people go hungry. But a third reason is climate change. And as the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said in a powerful speech May 18, which if you haven't seen, go back and look, drought, heat, and other extreme weather is also a major driver of this spike in world hunger. We're gonna put a link to the Secretary General's speech here in the chat. And also we're gonna to link to a, a pretty good New York Times story that showed how all of these factors are coming together and converging uh, in, in India where hunger is spiking as well. Dealing with this spike in world hunger is on the agenda at the G7 summit this weekend. Uh, begins June 26 on Sunday, continues through Tuesday the 28th. And Covering Climate Now is devoting two newsmaker interviews to this. Uh, there will be a newsmaker interview with Gabriela Bucher, who is the executive director of the anti-poverty NGO Oxfam International. Uh, she will be interviewed by our partners at The Guardian, Al Jazeera, and The Times of India later this week uh, for release next Monday on the 27th. We are also doing next week a post-mortem on the summit with Jennifer Morgan. She is the climate envoy for the German government and she'll be talking about what did and didn't get accomplished uh, in Germany this weekend. So food and water. And as we have just been discussing, obviously climate change is affecting food production, but it also works the other way around. How we produce food helps drive climate change. About one third of global emissions are related to the agriculture sector. And that's largely because A, Humans today, especially in the United States, are eating much more meat than uh, we ever did in our history. And meat carries a very strong carbon footprint. And the second reason is the way that we produce most of our food. The industrial agricultural method is very carbon intensive. And we'll get into that during this talk and shop. The good news for us as journalists is that food and water is tailor made for engaging our audiences. Every human has to eat and drink and it's a basic part of daily life and culture for people everywhere, which makes it an easy way for our readers, our listeners, and our viewers to tap into the climate story and understand how it connects to them personally and how they can affect it through their dietary choices. In fact, eating less meat is one of the top ways to uh, deal with the climate emergency. It was ranked number three in the book, Drawdown, which is one of those books that uh, every climate journalist should have on your desk. Draw down, it is a compendium of the top 100 climate solutions based on peer reviewed science. And don't overlook the follow up volume, which is called Regeneration. It is chock full of story ideas about how uh, farmers and, and consumers can change the food system. For example, Gabe Brown uh, is a farmer in. Uh, in uh, South Dakota, who, I'm sorry, North Dakota, who after one extreme weather event too many decided to switch his farm from the industrial method to the regenerative agriculture method. Turned out it made him money, saved his farm and is helping to save the planet as well. Regeneration is the name of the book. Covering Climate Now has arranged for all journalists who want access to, the, to, the, to that book. You can have free access to that book 
you need the passcode from us. So email us at editors at covering climate now and we'll uh, link you up there. And Gabe Brown will be a panelist at the press briefing that Covering Climate Now is doing next week, June 29. You can get more details. Just look in on our website, coveringclimatenow.org. Now, before I introduce the panelists for today, a couple of housekeeping items. I will introduce them all at once. Uh, we'll hear from them in turn during the first half hour. And then in the second half hour, your questions and answers. You're welcome to tweet throughout. Please use at Covering Climate Now and the hashtag CCNow. And now I hope you will join me in giving a very warm virtual welcome to our three sparkling journalists. Uh, we will uh, be beginning with Barbara Moran. She is a correspondent at WBUR, Boston Radio, Public Radio in Boston, on their environmental team where she focuses on climate science and solutions and contributes to the series Cooked, the search for sustainable eats. She's written for the New York Times and the Boston Globe and produced documentaries for the public broadcasting system here in the United States. Uh, then we will have uh, Vaishnavi Chandra Shaker. She is a freelance journalist based in Mumbai, India. She writes mainly on environment, science, and development. Uh, she has uh, been a consulting editor with the Times of India, which is a partner of Covering Climate Now. She also writes for National Geographic, The Atlantic, and The Guardian. And last, but certainly not least, Sonali Figueres. She is the founder and editor-in-chief of Green Queen. That's an online magazine based in Hong Kong that covers climate change, alternative proteins, and sustainability in general. Her public speaking engagements include the Harvard Business School and TEDx. So thank you all three for coming. And I believe that this might be the first time that we have all three partners at uh, three panelists at a talk and shop who are all partners uh, of covering climate now. So that's a nice landmark to, uh, to notice. So I'm gonna just dive right in and we're gonna start with Barbara. So Barbara, I know that you've been interested in the climate story for quite some time, but I'm curious, what made you decide that food was uh, an angle that you wanted to emphasize in your reporting? Well, it sort of started when I was covering the IPCC reports last year and I started to get really depressed. And I, we also started hearing that our um, audience was getting, I don't know, tuning out because it was just the news was so overwhelming. So those kind of things happened at the same time. And we were starting to think about how, how can we give the audience information that they could use, like what solutions that they could use to, um, you know, think positively about the, about the, the climate crisis and what they could contribute. So we had been thinking about doing a newsletter, a pop-up newsletter and some um, other content. And we said, well, let's try food. And I'm like, well, food, that'll be fun. You know, that, that maybe that'll cheer me up and it'll be less depressing and we'll give people some, you know, tips that they can use. So that's how, that's how we came um, about it. We, we did have a rule. So I'm in, I'm in Boston and I wanted to like actually do some journalism and not just things you could Google online, right? So um, we focused it on New England. So it's about sustainable eating in New England. And because I, I figured eating in sustainably in Boston is different than maybe eating sustainably in, in California or Costa Rica or somewhere like that. So we, we focused it um, on, on that subject, in that location. And so how much, uh sorry to use this term, but how much content have you all been producing? I assume you're producing both audio and uh, written content. How much, how often, and what's been the reaction both of your management and of your audience? <laughs> so um, we produce a ton of content. So we had a six part pop-up newsletter. I think we had three or four audio features. We did this like first person thing where me and two of the other reporters did like first person diets. Like I went vegan for a month and then one of our, our health reporter went, tried to eat no plastic and no plastic packaging for a month. And then another one tried to eat only local food for a month. I feel like I, or not a month, just a week. I felt like I got the easiest deal out of it. And then we all wrote about that and we went on air and sort of talked about our experiences. And that ended up being like a huge hit weirdly that first person stuff. Um, and the newsletter is doing really well. It's still open to, it's like a kind of evergreen. It's supposed to be evergreen for like a year so people can still subscribe. So we um, hit our subscription goals 
very quickly and um, management loves it. I think they might love it a little too much because they want me to do another one, but I like, I'm, it was too much work. <laughs> so I got it crashed after. So we'll, we'll see, you know, if there's going to be a cook too. I have to say to everybody who's listening, check out Barbara's story about when she tried to go vegan. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but you write also about your offspring and their attitude about this. Yes, yes. So I dragged, so I tried to do vegan January with my um, husband and two teenage or, you know, tween boys. And uh, yeah, I lasted for a month and they lasted for a week. And you can hear all all about it um and in my writing but yeah that was um I felt like it, it's sort of you know like you said in the open food is really personal for people and I think there are tweaks you can do like even cutting down meat a little bit makes a big difference and uh you know cutting down on food waste and and all these things so I felt you know I think it it did what it was I think it did what it was supposed to do mm -hmm. yeah and how overt were you about drawing the climate connection to what you were experiencing? Oh, totally overt. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I did, you know, I did a fair amount of research to make, you know, I, I did this, I guess I did this funny little dance because I did, you know, this, a lot of research to make sure that the, what connections were clear, but also didn't want to like turn people off by telling them what to eat. Right because eating is so personal and cultural and people have, you know, favorite foods and families and allergies and all these kind of things. And so, you know, I was sort of like, if you want to eat, you know, here's the deal with meat, you know, and if you want to eat meat more sustainably, here are some ways to think about doing it, you know? So um, that was sort of a, yeah. Sort of yeah, that, I mean, that really brings yeah. up one of the things I mentioned in my introduction is that one of the easiest ways, certainly if you're an American, is just to just not eat as much meat. You know, 60 years yeah. ago, Americans did not eat meat three meals a day. And that has shifted in these last 50 to 60 years. And that's largely, it's not because it's better for our health. Uh, it's largely driven by corporate advertising and, and uh, corporate um, imperatives. So one last question before I move on here, Barbara, um, what, what advice would you give to other journalists who are thinking about doing this? We like these talking shops to be very, you know, practical and constructive and sharing uh, within between newsrooms, rather. Um, from what you've learned from going through it, aside from it turned out to be maybe a little more work than you anticipated, <laughs> what, what, what would be your advice? Well, I feel like it was you know, I'm a, so I'm a climate reporter, right? And I feel like there is um, a, a surprisingly steep learning curve for me because a lot of the people I was talking to, I was talking to were like food people, right? Like foodies and food writers. And it was this like whole nother world of like jargon I had to learn. Like, I don't, I know all the science jargon and I'm used to talking to climate scientists and atmospheric scientists and I'm good with that, but all this like I don't know. So it was it was kind of humbling to sort of it was almost like a whole different area, and then trying to connect those two worlds, um, you know, it's a good it was a good challenge, but it took it was uh, more and more. I don't know. It was a little trickier than I than I expected. So give so yourself some time. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. It sounds like it. Give yourself a bit of a of a you know a runway to to, to get your speed up before you have to go on the air put put a story in the paper yeah, yeah. Okay, well thank you that's barbara moran of wbur public radio in boston and she will be with us for the rest of the hour of course i'm mark hertzgard i'm the executive director here at covering climate now we're so glad to have all of you with us and we're now going to switch all the way around the world through the magic of internet technology and we're going to talk to uh, Vaishnavi, and she is, as I mentioned earlier, she's been reporting on these issues in India for a while for a lot of different publications. So, um, you know, India is obviously one of the big players in climate politics around the world and in food. So uh, give us just a little perspective on uh, how that issue is playing out now in India. I referenced earlier this New York Times story that uh, about uh, 10 days ago that talked about how climate change in particular and the extreme weather, which has brutalized India, Pakistan, you know, this very, very hot, wet, hot spring that you had. Um, are you guys, has, has the monsoon season begun there yet? Or what's, what's the update? And then we'll get into some of the, the uh, you know, specifics.
I don't hear you speaking. I think you may have muted yourself. So let's take Sorry, two. can you hear me now? Now we hear you. All right. So maybe uh, that was thanks. monsoon. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, you know, in India, there's a saying that the monsoon is actually the finance minister of the country because everything depends on how good the monsoon is. Um, it determines the rest of the year, it determines food production, it determines incomes, especially rural incomes, and therefore consumption and, you know, the whole economic ripple effect. Um, this year, they forecast um, a good monsoon. The monsoon has just begun. Um, and, you know, fingers are always crossed that it'll work out that way um, because uh, rice production especially is dependent on a good monsoon. And India, as you know, is a um, huge producer of rice and a consumer of rice and an exporter of rice. And of course, uh, just a little earlier in um, this year, we had a little uh, problem with the wheat production because of a very unexpected heat wave. Um, so, you know, everyone's hoping that this monsoon will be good. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that problem with the wheat. Uh, for those who don't know, the Ukraine war, obviously Ukraine, a major breadbasket, the war shut down the supplies coming out of there that led to the global price of wheat to go way up. And that's mainly what drives hunger, folks. It's not that there's not food out there, but that the food is too expensive for the poorest people to buy. So when that happened, the Ukraine war, uh, Prime Minister Modi of India, uh, rather incautiously, I think, said, oh, well, India can feed the world. We'll just export more wheat. And then he had to withdraw that pledge because of this heat wave uh, that shriveled uh, production of wheat in, in India, not only India. So uh, one question, Vaishnavi, is has there been any blowback against Modi uh, for that and his the backtracking or is not? Is that a political issue there in India? Uh, I think internationally there was a lot of criticism and certainly perhaps, you know, his promise was a little uh, ambitious and sort of over optimistic. And um, but in India, I mean, local domestic food um, prices are the priority and food production is the priority. Um, India has a very large government food procurement and distribution system, um, and it distributes vast quantities of wheat and rice and other staples um, at very subsidized prices to about you know, 800 million people. And so um, the first priority is to ensure that that you know, bulwark against um, food shortages is there. I mean, that's a system that's 40 to 50 years old. And I think um, the step that Modi took was essentially to prevent prices from going up, um, you know, because farmers would sell for exports because of the, you know, rising wheat prices globally, and there would be less for procurement, you know, so it's, it's a sort of averting a potential crisis in the domestic um, um, market. But no, not, I mean, I'm the domestic rules, you know, in politics. So. Sure, of course. Yeah. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that, that um, you know, you've been covering the environment and sustainability for a while uh, and that you, you've increasingly been looking at the food related uh, implications of all that. So can you tell us a little bit just about your reporting on the ground? And in particular, yeah. for again, remembering that, that, you know, we're all journalists here, we're trying to help one another figure out how to do this coverage the best we can. Uh, but we're also very curious, those of us outside of India, about the situation there, because you are such a major player on the global stage. So can you tell us, you know, about your own reporting, especially on the ground there in the agricultural areas? Yeah, I first began um, climate reporting maybe 10 years ago as part of a fellowship. And, 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 it, and it strikes me now that, you know, 10 years ago, the first stories where I, I did from the ground were actually with farmers, because the farmers were the first to actually see and document changes that were happening. They were the most directly affected. So in fact, I, you know, I went to farmers in the Himalayas and because it was as wasn't as cold, um, some of them are moving their farm or farms upland, you know, um, because, you know, their apple crops were, um, weren't getting the right temperatures. And so actually, I think farming communities saw this, saw these changes happen, you know, much before we experienced them, you know, on consumer shelves or, um, you know, in public media consciousness. And I've sort of repeated, I've done a lot of um, climate science reporting, um, sea level rise, rainfall, extreme events, but I've repeatedly come back to um, looking at how communities 
are kind of uh, affected by uh, climatic changes on the ground. And also I've been looking at some of the solutions that are being tried out on the ground to help them adapt. I haven't looked too much at mitigation and that's partly because, um, you know, communities in India are sort of at the forefront of uh, climate change impacts. Um, as we said before, agriculture in India is very much monsoon dependent. Um, and most farmers in India are sort of small and marginal farmers. That means their plot size is really low. They're not very uh, rich. They don't have great access to information or credit. So they're very dependent. They live from season to season and they're very dependent on sort of good rains, good weather, predictable weather. Um, and so they're really, really vulnerable to climate change. And tell us a little bit about the reception that your stories have gotten both within the newsroom in other words you know does management like it are your editors open to these stories has that changed over time and also what's been the reaction of the public the readers yeah i think the management has never turned down stories on climate in the last 10 years but i have to say that the interest in the last three years has really skyrocketed and and that's because of you know the fact that now i think climatic changes extreme events are very visible now i think and the ipcc reports are becoming more and more strong and so for these reasons i think climate is sort of moving center stage and i do find this much more interest than it used to be and certainly i find the general public too is much more interested um i think uh previously i you know, my climate stories maybe 10 years ago didn't get so much of traction, but now they're much more discussed. Although I do think that there's still a connection to be made for consumers and readers between things that are happening out there and things we do, um, you know, the choices we make in, in, as consumers and in our daily lives and in maybe politicians that we vote for. That you're, you're underlining one of the themes that we always keep coming back to here at Covering Climate now in our three years of, of operation, <clears throat> that the climate stories that really penetrate and have an impact are tend to be human based. Yeah. Obviously, you have to have the science in there, but you have to be talking about people, not some abstraction and locally focused. Yeah. Again, the global importance of climate is obvious, but what people are going to connect to is with that local story. So uh, what you're describing there in India is actually a trend, uh, we think, in climate reporting all around the world. So um, that was Vaishnavi Chandra Shaker, and she is joining us from Mumbai, uh, India. She will be with us for the rest of the hour. Uh, she writes for Times of India, The Atlantic, National Geographic, The Guardian, and many more. And uh, now we're going to turn to Sanala Figueres. Uh, as I say, she was the founder and editor of Green editor-in-chief, got to get that right, of uh, Green Queen in Hong Kong. And uh, let's just start with a real basic question. I mean, your focus Sonali, has been really on food for quite a while. So um, in a way, maybe you're the veteran on this panel uh, of talking about the climate connection to food. So take us through your own decision-making process, if you will. How did you decide to make food and sustainability the focus of uh, your platform, and is there something specific related to Hong Kong that, that affected that decision? And I'm afraid you two are still muting yourself, so let's have a take two. Oh, it's like it's my first time. Um, I'm such, it's such a, it's so great to be here, and I'm such a fan of Vaishnavi and Barbara, and I'm definitely not the veteran, but um, talking about making things personal. My personal journey is really why um, food and sustainability and climate um, became such a focus and such a connection because I came to this, to Green Queen um, originally because I was really, really sick and I couldn't fix myself with um, regular allopathic medicine. And it was right around the time when Google kind of popped up and one could become a researcher um, and really kind of dive deep on subjects. And the more I dove deep on my symptoms and what was wrong, it led me to food. And so it came from health. But the more I looked into the food I was eating, the more I got concerned of, about how it was grown and the lack of transparency that I had had my entire life about it, especially in a city like Hong Kong, which you know, many, many decades ago actually was producing our own food. And today, 96% of our food is imported. 
a bulk of it from China, but also from other parts of the world. And so there was just no connection to, I mean, look, you know, talking about Barbara going on a on an expedition to, to eat locally for a month would, would not entirely be possible. Certainly, especially at certain seasons, like during, um, during the summer in Hong Kong, these months now when we are also in typhoon season, we, we just can't grow that many crops and we just don't have enough local agriculture. So all of that led me to really um, dig deeper and deeper. And of course, I, I, I became confronted with all the issues in our kind of very broken global, but also local food system. And I became more and more interested in, um, you know, I did come from a bit of a business background. And so I became more and more interested in the rising curves of protein consumption and just food production that were gonna be needed. Um, Hong Kong is a very unique uh, geographical location because we are within five hours of almost five billion people in the world and um, most of the world population growth will happen right around me so um, there seemed to be an imperative need to understand better well how are we going to feed the world if everyone in China and eventually everyone in India becomes middle class and decides they need to have you know, um, steak three times a day or what have you. Um, and so that's really where the, the, the curation of the writing led me. Um, and originally 10 years ago when Green Queen started, it really was a little bit more health and wellness. And I found like Vaishnavi that it was really difficult to get people engaged on environmental topics. But as the person who was the editor, I decided that my job was to kind of put those in there anyway. And of course, what happened is because we built that, that kind of arsenal of environmental content, which included things like pursuing um, stories about living zero waste and you know, the problem with plastic and what was a flexitarian diet. And um, you know, in about, about five years ago, we made the decision that we weren't gonna cover um, any lifestyle content that was promoting meat and dairy and seafood because we felt, well, we're a smaller media outlet and we can make that choice when all the other mainstream media in the region is promoting and writing about that stuff. So we just did it that way. And of course, what happened is in the last three years, the climate story became a global story and suddenly here we were with this kind of arsenal of content that was uh, resonating with folks. And, um, and that's how, you know, we sort, and then we were able to kind of pursue the climate story more. But even today we do focus still a lot on the kind of the consumer angle, which is very much, and that's why we've gone a little bit more into alternative proteins because we feel somehow the consumer business friendly news tends to uh, do well with our audience. I would say we have an audience that is pan Asia and now a little bit more global and they want to know who's trying to find solutions. I, I think it's fair to say Asia is a very entrepreneurial region and these stories of entrepreneurs that, that put climate at the heart of their mission and use food to kind of um, find solutions seems to really resonate uh, around. And we also are in a region where governments are very um, multi-year strategic. And I think it's become more and more clear for governments in China, in Israel, in Singapore, that um, food security is national security. I mean, let's also remember that, you know, a few years ago in China, it was pretty normal to have around 100 to 150 major food scandals per year. So unlike an American or a European consumer that can kind of trust that their food is basically safe to a certain extent, uh, consumers in Asia are very connected to food safety. Um, and they're also very connected to nutrition paneling in food in a way that's just different um, in the West. And so the, the, the kind of food policies are geared a little bit differently. Um, yeah, so what, what I'm hearing from you and, and all three of you panelists actually is that uh, food can be a, a terrific bridge. The subject of food can be a terrific bridge between personal health and planetary health. That your own individual personal health is affected obviously by what you eat. And then what we eat also affects the planetary health. And that seems to be the, the bridge 
that where we can make the connection to climate change. And that, of course, is what we're talking about at this talking shop. How do you make the connection to climate change in your food and water reporting? I'm very struck by what you said, Sonali, about being, you know, five billion people uh, uh, within sort of a, a half a day's uh, airplane ride from Hong Kong. It's Asia, really. Uh, we saw we sometimes forget this in North America and Europe. It's Asia where the climate future is arguably going to be uh, decided and is uh, in some ways the most extreme now. So as one more question before we go to Q&A here. So at Green Queen, as, you're, as you have been trying to make this ship, what have you learned uh, both in terms of your audience's reaction and, and sort of how it plays with, with management of about making that climate connection to the food? Uh, what have you learned along the way? And maybe preface that if you could for, for some of us, if you could just give a 60 second summary, why is it that, that meat is worse for the climate than say growing vegetables or even growing rice? What, what is it that gives meat such a strong carbon footprint? And then what has been your experience with trying to get that message across in your coverage? Absolutely, I'll start with the meat question. Um, just really quickly, obviously meat, and these are you know <clears throat> approximate figures, but uses around a quarter of the water um, that we that, it, that our water use globally. Um, about forty five percent of our land is either used for grazing animals or for growing their feed. Um, emissions, depending on which estimate you go with, between fourteen to eighteen percent of all global greenhouse gas emissions. So, and that's not even counting the secondary effects of um, industrial livestock agriculture, which is deforestation, um, you know, antibiotic. Uh, um, you know, the superbug growth, antibiotic resistance, um, you know, losing species, mass extinction, and, and so on and so, so forth. So it's just, unfortunately, the issue, if we take away the ethics of eating meat from this discussion, the issue is not whether you should eat meat or not. The issue is that people imagine when they're eating meat that maybe you know, they imagine a happy cow in a field and they imagine kind of, let's say, regeneratively grown meat or grass fed meat. But of course, 95 percent or so meat that we eat is industrially um, produced and that system just isn't working. And the other thing that I think is often missed in this conversation, um, especially when it comes to talking about alternative proteins, is that um, just really, really quickly, if if everybody in China um, started to eat the same amount of meat per capita as everyone in the US eats today, we would genuinely need um, between five and seven planets. So it's actually not a question of um, meat or not, it's a question of what are we gonna do when that demand grows and how are we gonna give, we, we need to find alternative ways to produce protein for that demand. So that's <clears throat> number one um, on the meat side. And then what have I learned? I think the thing that I've learned that shocks me the most, and that's because sometimes I'm just in, a, in my own little bubble, um, is that we've never had so much information at our fingertips on how our food is produced and what's in our food, in, just in terms of the explosion of social media. Um, but yet people remain so confused about what the right decisions are. And so that's why the reporting that um, Vaishnavi and Barbara are doing, especially all the first person stuff, I actually think that's what people want because they still come, every time I talk on a panel, I still have a line of people at the end who tell me, so what should I eat? And you know, this is despite, we have thousands of articles and guides and, and, and we're certainly, you know, a few years ago, we were unique in our coverage, but today mass media covers this and people are just so confused. So um, the great news for you know, climate journalists, as you said, food is so personal and um, there's so much up, up, there's so much, you know, um, there's so much we can do. There's so much more, more, many more stories we can tell. We need more Barbara's telling their story. We need more Vaishnavis telling the farmer stories. We need more of that because people are just so confused. But I think food is a way to really make that bridge because Everyone eats three times a day. I mean, other than breathe, breathing, it's the only thing that unites every single one of us. And that's exactly why Covering Climate Now is organizing its next joint coverage week around food and water. And uh, if you're not already involved, please go to the website. You can 
find out uh, what kind of coverage is offered. Of course, through Covering Climate Now, we have 500 plus news outlet partners around the world uh, that reach a combined audience of some 2 billion people. And we try to share our coverage one with another. So if you've got some great coverage on food and water and the climate connection, please put it in our sharing library and vice versa. If your outlet would like to run more excellent coverage and not just from these fine three fine journals who are with us today, but, but others go to the sharing library at Covering Climate Now and we will uh, connect you up. There's, as I mentioned earlier, we're doing two newsmaker interviews, but there's a lot of additional stories that are going to be running. And it really is a way to, to build your audience as well as uh, educate people. So let me uh, try and I'm going to take a couple of questions from the that have come in over the uh, RSVPs. And then I will just remind everybody online here, if you'd like to ask a question, please put it in chat. I see a couple have come in already. Uh, make sure when you put it in chat that you put it to everyone, not just to one person or it will get lost, uh, but to everyone. And I will try to get to as many as I can. Uh, one of the questions that came in before we started, I think is a really good uh, general one. And Barbara, I'm going to start with you, but um, I think all three of you might want to speak to this. And it's a little bit like the last question I asked you, Barbara, but it's sort of the next step. Here's a question from someone who says, I'm new to the climate environment beat. What are some common pitfalls that I should avoid when I'm reporting on agriculture and the environment, agriculture and climate, food and climate? What are the pitfalls? Uh, Barbara, why don't you start? Oh man, why do I have to start? All right, so I guess what I think is really interesting is how, how different the sort of local story is from the regional story is from the, um, you know, global story. Um, like, you know, beef, beef is really, beef is really interesting. And it's, it's not, I mean, it's produced very differently in different parts of the world. And so I was, you know, wrestling with how to, you know, how much of that information to sort of give to um, an audience. And, you know, in New England, we don't really have any industrial beef production, right? And we do have a lot of fish production. I don't know. So this is, so I guess that the pitfall is you have to, you can't just use like global stats if you're trying to talk about a local, a local issue. You have to dig up the, the local stuff if you want to make it relevant for your, for your audience. And that's not always that easy to do, right? Not that easy. But again, as I mentioned, that's one of our mantras here at Covering Climate Now. When you're trying to do the climate story, humanize it and localize it. You know, think globally, report locally, as we like to say. So Vaishnavi, a pitfall or two that you learned to avoid for somebody new to the beat. Um, I, I mean, I really want to second Barbara's point about context and local context. So one of the things that I found, for example, we talk about meat in a global context and the sort of emissions that it produces. But if you talk about meat in India, where we have a, a whole politics around meat eating that has to do with a right wing government uh, targeting beef eaters, for example, you have to be really careful. Um, about the context of which you're speaking, something that you know makes a lot of sense in one context, uh, a policy or a debate, um, you know, could have very different kind of effects in another context, and I think that is actually one of the hardest things to do. Um, the other thing that I would say is that it's so important to go to the ground and speak to people, um, because the, the way that people experience environment. Um, you know, uh, locally um, living on the land is, is so different from, um, you know, what you hear about in terms of just studies and models and numbers. And it's actually a much more interesting story. Boy, I, I, um, I will third that comment. Uh, one of the things we say at Covering Climate Now uh, is that on food and water, make sure you talk to somebody in your reporting who has their hands in the dirt right? A real farmer. I say this as some, I grew up with on a farm. And um, oftentimes here in the United States, there's a bit of, a, of an urban bias. A lot of the reporters in newsrooms are in urban areas. They have an urban mindset. And frankly, they look down on uh, farming people. They look down on rural communities. They think of them as uneducated, as backwards, as culturally uh, conservative, etc. They forget that they wouldn't be eating if those people weren't doing their jobs out on the farm. So get out there, talk to farmers. 
don't just write your stories based on what the agriculture minister says or the scientist uh, who's uh, quoted at a TED talk says, no offense to TED talks, but get out there with the people who are actually making the stuff grow in the ground. And now Sonali, uh, one pitfall to avoid before we go on to the next question. Um, for me, one of the big pitfalls is to avoid the kind of Silicon Valley techno optimist view of the world where, um, because I, I truly believe in alternative protein um, as a solution, not, not the solution, but an important solution uh, for the future, as I mentioned before, because I think we're not going to be able to feed everyone with the current system anyway. But I do worry that the alternative protein world is infected by yeah, what I call this kind of Silicon Valley techno optimist, you know, we're going to save the world. And it is very divorced a lot of times from um, the agricultural side uh, of the of the discussion. So I am really my next step now um, is now that everyone's reporting on people like Impossible Food is really to go more in that direction. And, and I do try to speak to people and do interviews with people like Errol Schweizer and, and Anna, Anna Lape, who are really on the other side of things, um, much more grassroots community organizers at the agroecology level. But I tell you, it is hard in the, in the consumer business world. It's easier to believe, you know, there is a silver bullet. And so I, I think the nuance now, now that we've opened that can of you know, all protein beans, it's time to add nuance and, and further kind of, uh, how are we going to make it work with the, uh, with the farmers and with the growers and, and with indigenous knowledge and with localized knowledge. And it's, it, I think it, there are people doing it so we can tell stories, but, you know, we have to be careful not to fall into that trap. This gives me an opportunity again to commend to everyone watching the book, Regeneration. Uh, again, you can have access for free through Covering Climate Now, a new book that really talks in very specific terms about the shift to regenerative agriculture. The current system is oftentimes called industrial agriculture or mass commodity agriculture, uh, which is, has a very strong carbon footprint. Regenerative agriculture, quite the opposite much lower footprint, but also critically, regenerative agriculture is much more resilient to the droughts, to the downpours, to the extreme heat, all the things that climate change is gonna be bringing. Check out Regeneration. There are literally dozens of specific story ideas in there about farmers who have their hands in the dirt, who have made these shifts uh, that you can you know, write about and uh, interview and, and so forth. So um, again, you can get that on our website, coveringclimatenow.org. Um, here's, here's an interesting question that also came in on the RSVPs, and this is a little bit more uh, sort of big picture, but uh, it talks about the difference in perspective between the global South and the global North. And here's the question, how do we cover the impacts of climate change on food, on water, in a way that makes a comfortable middle-class American audience care about those issues without burying the reality that it's people in the global South and vulnerable people also in the global North, but basically the poor, the world's poor, who are suffering from food and, insecure, food and water insecurity the most. As I said earlier, 276 million human souls around the world tonight are not going to have food and then didn't have it last night either. How do we hold both of those stories and convey both of those realities in a way that reaches all of our different audiences? And I'm not going to pick anybody for this, uh, but why don't you, who wants to speak to it and just raise your finger and go ahead. Come on, somebody got to raise their finger. I'll try to do, but I don't, this is the million dollar impossible question, right? That's, I mean, why you get that's, paid that's why nobody wants you. to volunteer, okay. right? I mean, this is like, you know, I mean, we, like I didn't in my, in my reporting, I didn't really talk about the effect on the global South. You know, I talked about food insecurity in New England. It's like 15% of people in, in our region are, have food insecurity. And, um, you know, our, how do you eat less imported food? You know, and it touched on the, the global issue. But I mean, I think what I'm part of the reason why I focus on this is because people are getting overwhelmed with the global 
issue, right? And then, so it's like, well, here's how you can help the global thing with what you are individually doing. Mm -hmm. But yes, I mean, if anybody else has other ideas, I'd love to hear them. Uh, Vaishnavi, I hope you don't mind if I a little bit put you on the spot because it yes. strikes me, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, sometimes outsiders have this impression of India that, oh, it's just um, 1.3 billion people who are on the verge of starvation. And it's not at all the truth. You have a very strong, a very large, rather, middle class and even upper middle class there. And so how do you as a reporter speak to both of those realities within India? Yeah. Uh, that's a that's a great question. And I have to say that it is tough. Um, you're right. I mean, we sort of have a sort of mini uh, north and south in India where we have these urban middle class and uh, rich um, who often are the readers of, say, English language dailies um, that I write for. And then we have a rural um, middle class as well, but also a lot of poor and also a lot of urban poor. So we have these sort of very divided kind of societies and segments. And, and, and that's why I think local stories really matter because you can, you know, each, each story can be a snapshot that's relevant to one group at a time and it doesn't have to encapsulate everything. But I think um, what is wonderful is sometimes when you can find that story that connects the two and that's a food story uh, very often because, you know, how climate change affects farmers, affects farming, affects the food supply. And that affects the food that's supplied to you. Um, why do you have a shortage of, um, you know, oil on the shelves today? Well, palm oil right now, actually, in India. Um, and of course, it's the Ukraine crisis, but it's also because of natural disasters and environmental changes. And, and it, I mean, the perfect story is when you can bring them together. It's not always possible. And so, you know, and, some, and so you just have to be reconciled to doing sort of snapshots of different segments and trying to make you know, different segments of society care for, you know, what's going on somewhere else. So again, this underscores the importance of localizing your reporting and humanizing your reporting. And uh, to use an American baseball analogy, you don't have to hit a home run every time, folks. Some nice singles will eventually score the run. So um, we're going to stay with India for a second. I see a, an interesting question here in the chat, and this is another one of those million dollar questions. But um, if you've been covering uh, food for a while, as I have, this is, you know, one of the elephants in the room, so to speak. And here's the question from uh, Timothy A. Wise. Uh, question. India's green revolution is now criticized on environmental grounds. Africa is following that flawed model, as I have written, I being Timothy Wise. Uh, how can this failure, the failure of the green revolution, get greater media attention? So Green Revolution, for those of you who may not be up to speed, Green Revolution came uh, really through the Rockefeller Foundation uh, in the 60s and 70s. They were uh, appalled at a human level of the great amount of famine that was in, in India. And the Green Revolution was a very techno-based approach to growing more food. It was about getting different uh, seeds and developing different varieties and putting a lot more fertilizer in the ground and a lot of other things that I'm oversimplifying here that did indeed boost production. Uh, no question about that. And also no question that it kept literally millions of people from starvation in the relatively short to medium term. Over time, however, uh, the environmental impacts of that approach to agriculture have been very, very controversial to say the least. Uh, because of the fertilizer, because of all these other things, the soil itself is being weakened. And what gets much less attention, the power of food companies in the supply chain, up and down the supply chain, was dramatically increased. And this is something that all of you in, in your reporting, this is one of those things that we don't talk about enough, that uh, Yes, it's important to talk to the farmers who have their hands in the ground. And in, in America, if you'll talk to them, they are frustrated as hell that there's monopolization. When they buy the seeds, there's no competition. So they're being priced out. When they sell their product at the end of the year, there's only one mill that they can sell it to. And so they have to pretty much take the price that's there. The monopolization, the corporate control, and the Green Revolution really uh, intensified that. So with that as background, Let's all talk about how, how can we get uh, greater media attention on that? And I'm sorry, Vaishnavi, I don't put you on the spot again because India really is, 
you know, you guys were, were the, the, the test case and sort of the famous. Um, so where do things stand now in terms of the, the government position and the public position on a green revolution approach to agriculture? Yeah, I think there is a lot of debate and criticism now in the last, like I would say, 10 to 20 years of, uh, of the Green Revolution. And in a way, there always has been. I mean, I think um, people would say, yes, it did, it did do, it did stop food shortages. Uh, India did achieve um, self-sufficiency in food production. Um, and that was a great thing, but there is a lot of criticism on, you know, the, in the highly industrialized, highly intensive, um, technological kind of um, mode of farming that it promoted. And in fact, um, one of the things I always say is that climate change actually offers you the opportunity to examine existing systems um, and historical systems and how they came to be. And uh, so for example, um, what we're seeing a lot of now, especially among the middle class, but also in climate sort of adaptation and mitigation um, policies and projects is a return to, uh, you know, because in the, in the green revolution, wheat and rice became the top grains that were produced. And a lot of um, other grains that, um, you know, are less, now they're less fashionable. They're not eaten so much anymore, except by the poor, but they are hardier grains, right? And, and they at one time provided a more diverse nutritional diet to people, to communities. And a lot of, um, um, you know, scientists and adaptation projects now are trying to convince farmers to go back to some of those grains, um, sorghum, maize, millets, um, that actually would stand some of these weather variables better. Um, and at least they won't be so affected um, by changes in rainfall or droughts. And also uh, from a nutrition perspective, it's better to have a diverse um, diet than, you know, to be exclusively focused on wheat and, ra wheat and rice. And I think that debate is coming up a lot more and it's being discussed a lot more. Um, I think there was a recent study that showed that, um, you know, alternative grains such as millets um, and sorghum can actually lead to some, you know, uh, greenhouse gas reduction of uh, 50 million tons or something like that. So this is definitely being discussed more. And I'm sorry to sound like a broken record, but that book Regeneration has numerous examples of how farmers are shifting away from the so-called, you know, the, the major grains of wheat, rice, and corn, which are what the corporations want to have grown uh, to a whole, actually should say it's not shifting, but going back uh, to what farming did for thousands of years, many different uh, varieties. Uh, Sonali and then Barbara quickly, do you have any thoughts on this? How can we do more telling? How can we as reporters uh, do more telling of this story of the Green Revolution, which is, I would, with with apologies to Mr. Weiss, I would say, can kind of almost uh, shoehorn into the difference between the current system, the industrial agriculture system, and the regenerative system, covering that transition. How do we do that, Sonali, and then Barbara? Um, one uh, one thing I that strikes me, um, speaking of of people who are bridges between the that conversation and kind of consumers, and is chefs. And, 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 you know, people who are in that part of the food supply, um, I, I tend to find that they tend to be connected to the growers and to the agricultural side of things, but then they're also connected to the consumer. And you find this a lot, even with people in wine, for example, because, you know, it's so connected to the climate. Um, and, and so I think there's a lot of scope to, to, to kind of mine them for knowledge and kind of involve them more in the climate story, um, you know, um, because I, I will think say in the, in the United States, that is a really popular uh, kind of pardon the pun staple of, of uh, morning television is having chefs on the air and showing you, oh, cook this. Um, and so uh, that's, that's an interesting way to get into that. Right, but, but even getting them to talk more about how they choose the foods that they choose and why and what's on their menu. And, and I think people are really receptive to that. And, and, and there's also a really great question on climate resilient food. And I know a lot of the conversation about um, climate and food tends to be on meat and meat reduction. But I can tell you that in Asia, we have a ton of really interesting um, entrepreneurs and chefs and growers that are really looking at 
uh, really changing the basket of crops that we use to more resilient ones. Because I, I have to say, one of the things, if I had to make a prediction um, on this panel, one of the things that I think consumers are not aware of enough um, despite the great sriracha shortage. And currently I'm in France, there's a mustard shortage. There is no mustard on any shelf because of what's going on. Um, I think people are not at all clear enough on how much food that is in their fridge and in their pantry is going to be missing in the next few years. And actually one of our most popular stories was the one that we shared with CC Now a couple of years ago. It's still very popular about the five breakfast foods you, you may not have anymore, chocolate, banana, uh, coffee, right, um, or uh, potatoes. I think people are not clear that their plate is really gonna change. And I think that's a great way to personalize it and, and to kind of get involvement with interesting people, farmers that are doing interesting things. And, and that is part of the green revolution story as well. Great. Uh, Barbara, one quick word from you and then we'll wrap up. Uh, it can either be about reporting on this shift from the industrial ag to regenerative ag or anything, any other point you'd like to make? Well, one thing I, I did in the newsletter, which I thought was, uh, came out really interesting was I, I spoke to a bunch of um, indigenous farmers about the um, indigenous food sovereignty movement. And there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on there in the, um, in North America with, with seed saving and soil regeneration. And um, it's, it's loops, loops back and sort of how can you, how can you, you know, go, go back to some of the good stuff that was before the green revolution, but still have, you know, food, enough food for everybody. So um, I found that uh, a really good, good way to go. Uh, that is one of those topics, the whole indigenous role of this, that uh, I'm sorry we didn't touch on more in this hour, but it is a major focus of, again, our week of coverage next week. Uh, look in the sharing library at coveringclimatenow.org, the regeneration book, the drawdown book, talk about the, the indigenous knowledge as well. And I hope that all of you have learned from, from this hour. I'd like to uh, thank very much our three uh, distinguished panelists who have joined us from really quite an extraordinary range of time zones today. Uh, we've had Barbara Moran in Boston. She is a correspondent at WBUR public radio station in Boston, where she focuses on climate science and solutions and contributes to the series Cooked, the search for sustainable eats. And from Mumbai, we have had uh, Vaishnavi Chandrasekhar. She is a freelance journalist, but she's written for a lot of outlets, Times of India, The Guardian, The Atlantic, and uh, National Geographic. And uh, as well, we've had from, I was gonna say Hong Kong, but I gather she's now in France, uh, Sonali Figueres, and she is the founder and editor of Green Queen online magazine in Hong Kong. Of course, there are links to all of these panelists' work uh, at coveringclimatenow.org. I'll just remind you again, we have two newsmaker interviews coming up, uh, <clears throat> four partners in the Covering Climate Now collaboration, first with uh, Gabriela Bucher of Oxfam International. We hope that will be taped on Friday, and we hope to run it on Monday during the G7 summit. And then next week will be Jennifer Morgan, the climate envoy of the German government, and uh, we'll be deciding after we tape that when that will run, but that will be basically a postmortem on what does and does not happen at the G7, in particular around the question of climate and food. So thank you all for being with us today. Uh, it's been our pleasure, and we hope that you will stay in touch with Covering Climate Now as we go forward. I'm Mark Hertzgard, and I'm the executive director here at Covering Climate Now, and we wish you all a very pleasant day. <laughs>